Hi, uh, my name is Namit. Um, I have a question, maybe Mika might be or, uh, in a better position to answer that. So we, we talked about data and uh, GDPR is one big regulation that affects how an enterprises store and use data. But I suspect eventually governments are gonna go beyond just data and also look at what data enables. A uh, case in point is uh, a white paper that the UK government released earlier this year called the Online's Harms White Paper. It's an outrageous piece of, piece of document because it, it just goes in a superlative, uh, uh, punitive suggestions for what organizations can do. But we also talk a lot about ethics of machine learning and AI. So my question is that we know that eventually governments are gonna go uh, after regulations. What is the role that companies can play, and for example, Mozilla Foundation, to inform them better of how to make good regulations? And regulations is one thing. Uh, industry groups also come under ISO to, f to set their own standards in a lot of ways. And that's particularly where companies can influence how ethics or good, government, uh, good governance is incorporated into the businesses. So do you think, um, industry has a role to play there, and how do you think uh, Mozilla might uh, like to get involved? Absolutely. Um, so I'll start off, and then if anyone wants to join. So I think the starting point, you know, why, yes, the governments are increasingly looking into regulation all over the world. They're taking different approaches, um, and some of the approaches are alarming, as you mentioned in the paper. Um, but if we go into the cause, it's because everyone is fed up. At the end of the day, people are like, there's something wrong, and, and what can we do? And I think that's where it's incumbent on companies. If companies don't want terrible regulation, we are the ones who are empowered to start making change. If companies, let's say, ideally, if all companies follow lead data practices, and they just started building their products, focusing on smart data collection, focusing on actually being transparent with people and allowing people to understand and giving people choices, building in security so that breaches are going to happen, but that they're not at the scale that you see. That would have changed that if that had happened in the Maya ideal world, then you wouldn't see all of this sort of reaction that's coming and, and there's this push that we have to solve this problem immediately. Um, so that's where I do think that Industry absolutely has a role to play. Industry, it is, companies don't need to wait for regulation. Companies can start making changes today. If you're in charge of your own company and you have all the reason to build trust with your customers and for all the reasons everyone described, there's actually a lot of value to your own business. Um, so I'll see if anyone else wants to add And to it's that. more than just being altruistic. I believe there is a business uh, angle here that will be beneficial as, as a competitive, competitive differentiator uh, because you'll be ready when, when and if, if and when there's uh, some regulation that comes. You'll be more prepared because you know, you know, every, you know exactly uh, why you chose that data and um, you'll be able to be much more transparent as well. And I think it's actually, in addition to industry, consumers have a, a, a very powerful voice here too, you know, people feel frustrated. Like I mentioned, I was too lazy to call my dentist and tell them, please delete my record. But you actually experience multiple moments like that throughout the day in all the products that you experience. Um, and so we also then have the ability to start getting on social media, talking, complaining. And the more companies hear that, I think that also adds to that circular of they understand that there is value to making these changes. There's a question in the back. I'm coming from health industry. My name is Akshay. So uh, the questions that we need to ask is not very well defined in, in industries like health where where we are hoping that we collect a lot of data, we can then do some analysis on it and then figure out something useful for the user. So uh, maybe this question is to Rebecca. So how do we know, I mean, in industries like those, or even for tech companies like Google, 
except for saving on electricity and uh, you know and now that they are gdpr compliant at least they are able to be transparent and protect privacy in at least european countries so what is wrong in them collecting a lot of data why should they stay lean when we do not yet know that there are i mean we when we do not yet know the questions that's a really really good question um, i think that you kind of have to take it on faith until your faith is broken in these companies and that is kind of scary because for something like health in particular um, the outcomes can be pretty deleterious for society so it's good until it's not and this is sort of true for a lot of these types of applications so i was thinking about how i would answer your question as well um, where uh, i think that a lot of companies really can only promise transparency because privacy as a concept in most people's minds is something that is pretty inconsistent a lot of people are fine with the practice until something happens and then they're not. Uh, and so I think this is also true for these sort of health applications where people are fine when they hear all of the ways in which it's being used really well, but then suddenly it's not, and then all of a sudden it's the worst thing ever. And that is one of those practices where, uh, because it can lead to actual bad outcomes for people's health, uh, and that could have bad social impact, um, it seems like Again, it's, it's not just not collecting a lot of data. If you saw how we talked about it at Firefox, we actually collect a lot of data. We're just really transparent about what we're collecting and why we're doing it. So I would say for those health outcomes, if you were collecting a lot of data, as long as you're transparent about what you're collecting it and why you're doing it, you're still following these lean principles. Maybe you want to also add, um, we've talked about how you can certainly start collecting everything because you're not sure how it's going to be used in the future, but that's actually not going to be necessarily useful for you in the future. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, I think about how um, consumer preferences change over time. And uh, a, a common example for a lot of data scientists is like you, you say fashion is a big place where you see a lot of data science. Like Stitch Fix is a company that has made lots and lots of money doing this, but fashion changes. Uh, with every season. So if you're using old data to fit these models, you have to continuously refresh it with every new seasonal change. Um, and I think also with health applications in particular, um, a lot of the data science applications, uh, they don't have a lot of underlying theory about how these things work. So you end up with models that seem to be very successful at predicting a known health outcome, but then new health outcomes come out where we don't really know how the theory relates. So again, I think that when you're thinking about how these sorts of practices work, really it's just transparency in the end and hoping that like, through the transparency, people can independently look at the way you're thinking about data and they can decide whether they trust your intent. Uh, and that is ultimately why people believe in Google's because that, that, that company is really doing a lot of publishing. They're publishing a lot of what they're doing. So that actually leads to intent. If they just produced a product where suddenly there was a magical health application and you couldn't really figure out how it worked, um, Again, it works until it doesn't, and sometimes that leads to bad outcomes for society. It's also a role, uh, an application where data, the importance of data governance can really still be applied. So for example, um, let's say you don't know entirely where the, the data value will be. One aspect of application of data process is that, look, we are going to revisit this data collection one year from today, or six months, or whatever it is. Most companies don't do that, but that is actually where it's going to get around over time, that that feature was deprecated, or that intent, all the six months that we spent ideating on this particular feature, we moved on to something else. And so it's important to then come back and say, okay, do we still need this? Um, or another way to apply you know, data governance to what type of, we're not sure, so let's collect a lot, is to do it on a smaller scale. So perhaps you don't need to collect it from everyone, but launch small experiments over time um, that are timed. Uh, we do this a lot in the browser, in Firefox and Firefox Lite. And so we'll set out at the outset and say, we're gonna do this for six months, and then we're gonna come back and revisit this if this is actually important. And we're not going to launch to 100% of our users. We're gonna start with 1% or, or whatever. And then we're gonna tweak it as we go along. It also goes back to, if I can answer that, is um, having a product-based approach to how you try to solve any problem. So trying to understand really what it is you're trying to solve in this, even in a healthcare feature or a healthcare product, 
what problem you're trying to solve and work, work from there. Uh, and then trying to feed that problem or solve that problem with um, the, uh, the hypothetical kind of data that you need or the, the models that you're looking for and work from there. I, mean, I, I still think it's, it goes back to trying to solve a problem uh, instead of just collecting everything and then, and then hopefully something is, you know, come, magically comes out. I don't think it works like that. So there is, I saw two, a couple hands. One is in the second row over here. Someone wants to bring a mic. And then there is a hand in the back after that. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk, guys. Uh, I just, from what I take away is that there seems to be a trade-off between having better data and having more data. I don't know if that's true. That it might not exist. Uh, my question is that across Silicon Valley in big tech, you've got Google, Amazon, and Facebook. And where do you think they lie uh, on having better data? Or are, are this is all focused on collecting more data? and just don't care about the quality. Uh, what, what do you think is the ranking on that? Any thoughts? I think that a lot of these companies are hiring for people who do privacy-minded work now. Um, you can see the job descriptions and you can see the way that they're trying to navigate this problem. So I think they're thinking about it. Um, they might not be thinking about it the exact same way that we are, but they are absolutely hiring for people who think this way. So it suggests to me that um, they care and that they're starting to think about this in a way that um, really affects the way that they do business. A lot of jobs, just so we're clear. <laughs> there is a question in the back. Yeah, my name is Raghu and <clears throat> uh, startup where we actually uh, have uh, users location we know because we need to show the user what's the mobile network quality we have. And uh, while we're close to in uh, six countries right now, um, the paradox is that, and you know, shamelessly what happens is that you have this legal genre of writing everything. And I myself as a co-founder don't understand all the linguistics aspects of that. <clears throat> so with apologies to the actual user, uh, what your ideas on showing something very simple so practically what happens is that when you install an app, an Android app or an iOS app, you ask those six or seven you know, questions or permissions. And by default, you grant them. If you don't grant them, you are penalized, right? Because the app doesn't work well for you. And then you have this huge uh, legal uh, thing to cover you yourself. So I think our dilemma is that what do you, how do you show it you know, in a simple way and yet you actually are legally safe. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. So first of all, there is no um, black and white description of this is the way the privacy policy must be done. And actually, I mean, we've done research into our own products. Um, so on the main Firefox landing page, where you could go and download Firefox, we did a test. Um, and we saw only one, so there's a hyperlink to the privacy policy, and then you download the product. Only 1% of users clicked on the hyperlink. So that's great for those 1% of users. We're happy they found the link. But then what about the rest of the 99%? They might care about privacy too, but that means we are not doing our job effectively if, if we're not able to give them the information in the time that they want it. Because let's be real, you're excited about downloading a new product or a new app. I don't know if you're reading every line of that 15-page terms and conditions and privacy policy. And it's too much information in the beginning. It actually makes more sense maybe when you're in the experience of the product. Um, companies that will take permissions instead of take all the permissions at the outset, but rather ask you in the moment, hey, by the way, can, do you, would you like me, would you like to share your location data? Then we can provide this customized feature. And then you can make a choice in that moment and say yes or no. That we think is the better way. Um, and we love when we see companies doing, taking that approach, and, and uh, it's called sort of in-context notices or in-time notices, rather than um, companies that take the approach of, oh, well, we put it all in our privacy policy. Um, so an example, so in Firefox, after we did that test, what we did was um, when the browser opens, the second tab, there's the home page, and then the second tab now is the privacy policy. Uh, and we know that uh, the percentage of people who engage with that has jumped. So we 
we think we're doing something right for the people who care, it's easier. We also did something where we use expanders. Like, you, people don't read A to Z, especially in that new onboarding experience. And so we, we just have bullets. And we tried to make it very short, and we use expanders so that people can find what they're interested in easily. Um, so I think there's a lot of product experience and product design that could be applied to the data collection. Um, I think we have a question um, online. Yes. Uh, so Shrikant asks, how does one push for lean data practices in a policy slash regulatory environment which enforces data maximization and calls it empowerment? Where do you want to go with that? <laughs> Let's read the question again. <laughs> Take it in pieces. How does one push for lean data practices in a policy slash regulatory environment which enforces data maximization and calls it empowerment? Do you want to start then? Sure, absolutely. Uh, like I think uh, the answer uh, in many ways is, uh, I think lies in something that both Stan and Rebecca already mentioned as a part of their talk, which is that uh, a lot of the principles behind lean data practices are fundamentally principles that are up to companies to follow. And in fact, not just companies, but for governments, for civil society, and for any agency or entity that deals with data to follow. And uh, regardless of the environment and what the incentives in the environment necessarily align for, I think we've seen sufficient evidence in India that when it comes to lean data practices, consumer trust and privacy are valid competitive advantages by which people make choices between services. And the number of people who like make this choice is increasing almost every day. And the awareness around these issues is also increasing. So I guess what people would then have a choice between is A, going along with the environment and doing what is fashionable at a given moment versus B, going and building long-term consumer trust via long-term practices that showcase that 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 entity believes privacy is a fundamental right. And, and I think we are seeing evidence that people will start caring a lot more about B than they do about A in the long run. And I think, yes, it's up to the entities to choose what they'd like to do. So WhatsApp is uh, piloting payments in India. You can use WhatsApp to send money to someone in India. Uh, it's trial. It's limited to 1 million users right now. But a lot of us have it and have used it. And uh, when you use WhatsApp, you're told that your messages are end-to-end -end encrypted, which means that only you and the recipient uh, have access to the message. But when you send a payment through WhatsApp, that's not true anymore. And that's partly architectural. There are, uh, obviously, the sender and the receiver are aware of the fact that a payment has been made. But um, UPI uses the email scheme of having a domain and a username at a domain. and um, now, if you look at the number of parties that get access to this knowledge of a transaction being made, the sender and the receiver, the UPI ID providers on both sides, the sender's ID provider, the receiver's ID provider, then the bank that provided that ID, uh, apart from the app, so the app on both sides knows it, that the transaction has happened, the bank that provides the ID on the sender's side and the receiver's side knows it. That may not be the same bank at which the account is held, uh, because UPI is an interoperable protocol, so now you've got sender and receiver, app on both sides, ID providers on both sides, and bank on both sides, and NPCI, which is the intermediary body through which all of this happens. So you've suddenly gone from a private conversation between two people to what, seven parties now? Um, and nowhere in the terms and conditions are you told about what the data retention policies of all these various entities is. Okay, and so that's one. That's, that's what Shrikan means by data maximization that a lot of these parties are encouraged to collect this data with no clear terms, and that's the law, that's a requirement. You know, it's a part of the architecture, it's enforced through various um, mechanisms, whether it's law or coercion or oligopolies. Uh, like, I mean, I just think that, which is why uh, we completely agree with you, right? And we think that uh, at least uh, that's the reason why India needs a strong data protection law as soon as possible. Because in order to even begin understanding such processes, setting standards for what kind of disclosures company need to give, 
and also for users to be able to hold these seven to eight parties to account saying what data do you have about me what can you do what can you do with that data or not there needs to be a legal framework that empowers users to do that in the first place and that's and that's something that i think even at the highest levels of the country like there is some agreement that it needs to happen but we we just think that it needs to happen as quickly as possible because it's only when that framework exists that both in instances of whatsapp as well as with other sort of like sort of collection of data by the government as well as private entities can users truly hold them to account yeah and i'll just add i still think uh, we yes absolutely we need law and in the law there will also be provisions for data minimization and and passing on responsibility so that you know for example whatsapp um can't just say oh well, actually those were my processors WhatsApp is then responsible, and those are res responsible for for managing those data processors in the background. But on the product side, this is something that can be solved, and this is where we think more focus should be. That's for the company to invest on the product side to explain to people. It doesn't have to be boring. You don't have to have you know several paragraphs explaining it. It can simply be something that says like, how does this work? people aren't dumb a lot of people the people who care will click on the link and that is an easier way for them to know rather than you have to go hunt through every single company and then their policies um there's a question in the middle so i don't have a question but i have a comment to add um, from a consumer's point of view is a lot of times consumers tend to believe that new products are uh, priceless i mean they just have to use it so i think as consumers we have to learn to let go so uh, from for example from your point of view i have a cautionary tale so uh, one of my somebody i knew came up with a new app for investment advice so they would take a lot of your data and advise what products you should buy from the market and i went through their privacy policy and i knew the co-founder so i asked questions and within the third or the fourth message the person says you know dude even i haven't read my privacy policy so carefully <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's a bad place to be and as a consumer then you should be okay to let go of such products I mean, not every product is uh, i mean inevitable Rebecca, this question is to you. So, uh, you talked about these three points, right? Like better data leads to less time wasted, improved productivity, and better models. Mm -hmm. And my takeaway from that was like it's primarily around usage of data. I'm, I'm still wondering if, let's say, there are 100 attributes out there, and I still identify these are the five core ones that I need, and I'm park them out, but I still and I use them for you know training my models for my data scientists to use. I can still make an argument for collecting the remaining 95 attributes and parking them uh, for use in future, uh, as, as you were talking about. What's the argument against that? That's still lean data practice or lean data usage, but not lean data collection. So I still think that as long as you're clear with your intent about what you're trying to do, we collect data. We collect petabytes of data, and we have collected a lot of data in the, in the browser product that um, we have an intent for it. And we want to use it to answer those types of questions. And I think that when you're seeing a lot of these um, new regulations coming out, and I'm not the expert on this, so I hope you two can speak to this, but this sort of secondary use of thinking about data collected under one intent and then using that data set for something that users are not aware about, that's starting to become something that people are starting to point fingers at. So again, um, I think the most important takeaway from that is if you think you're going to use this data for more purposes like that, just disclose it. Uh, just be transparent about it. If you intend to use it to train a model, you already you already just described how you have a thought about what you want to do for it uh, with that data. So just write that down. Um, you don't have to hide that you're trying to think about questions that you have uh, already identified are going to be down the line, like in the future. But you should acknowledge that that's an, an intent that you want to use this data for. It might just not be immediate. But again, to me, it just seems more like the whole point about these fairness, accountability, and transparency practices, uh, it's really about making sure that the context under which you're trying to collect data, that actually does affect the way you are collecting it. Um, and it's really about making sure that you're collecting as much of that information about why you wanted to collect that data at the time of collection, because times change. So 
So what you just said doesn't really, um, I guess, uh, it still feels like it's in the spirit of what we're trying to communicate. So if you, uh, uh, can you just hold on? There's a mic coming your way. So if you um, expose the reason why you are collecting a data, wouldn't it kill your comp? I mean, wouldn't it kill the competitive edge that you have? Uh, that that's one way of looking at it. I mean, if uh, I'd say, hey, uh, this is the reason why I'm collecting the data. Second uh, uh, thing would be um, the exploratory approach, which is what I think Akshay talked about, where I have no problem. I just want to see if there's really anything, so I just keep collecting data randomly and then search for a problem, which is what I think seems to be the approach. I don't know. There's two outcomes there. Um, one is that you're exposing yourself to a lot of risk in this world that we now live in. Um, and the other problem is that you might actually just start wasting all of your time trying to find something that you can solve with this particular set of data. Uh, and on top of all of that, I still think that uh, what we've been trying to communicate is that the competitive advantage is actually the user experience. Um, the practices that we're providing and that we're advocating for uh, have these sort of downstream benefits for the data science as well. But it also leads to a world where you can build a better user experience for uh, your, your users. Uh, because I think in the end of the day, people don't want to not use technology. People don't want to not have these smart um, applications, these smart products. They just don't want to feel like they're being taken advantage of. And, and really, it's about building that trust with your users. So again, like if you are doing something like in this application that you just described, I think if you're open and honest with your intent about like, yes, this is actually a research application. We don't have um, a product idea. We're thinking about the, the idea of building a research foundation that could then deliver a product idea. That is something that I think a person would be more likely to believe in. And actually, Apple does this. If you look at their products, you can opt into a research arm of uh, the health kit that they offer. And they, they're using that data for research purposes, and they're not promising product delivery out of that. But they will use it for informing the research that then might lead into product. But again, they're open with their intent, and they're transparent about what they're doing. And it goes back to that Warren Buffett quote. You know, your, your reputation is easily lost in five minutes. And so I think any company that is secretly collecting data because they think that there's a competitive advantage and that they cannot reveal it and be honest with their users is kidding themselves. And um, you see this like in voice and speech. Major companies have gotten publicly called on by, you were listening to my recordings in my family, in my home. Um, that's going to catch up one day. So we have time for a couple more questions, and then we'll wrap up. There's uh, one in the back here, uh, one in the middle, and then one in the third row. Uh, yeah, hi. So uh, question probably a different uh, nuance, but since there is so much concern about the privacy, is there a framework or a rating agency? Now we're talking about regulator to regulator. So I don't know, like give a, you have this uh, better bureau, you know, type of stamp given for small businesses. This who to govern for large businesses, right? So we hear about uh, breaking up some large corporations. That that's a different discussion. But on privacy term, is there any sort of rating? If I have a star, it means that your data is. So I'm I'm saying that at the GDPR level, users don't know GDPR is a like a big thing to read about, right? But from a very simplistic way, how do I say that? You know, uh, yeah, this is trusted. So there's a lot of civil society organizations that publish industry reports and they'll focus on different sectors. Maybe we'll know some examples. They look at companies. Um, so for example, the electronic, the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, they publish a report. I think it's called Who's Got Your Back? And they will um, look at companies' transparency reports and kind of give you an, an analysis. Um, and then data protection authorities in countries that, where there is data protection regulation, they are the ones who are in the best position to really enforce um, and, and make sure companies are doing what they said. Yeah, and we also have Divij, uh, who's now a Mozilla fellow uh, with us, but uh, who actually, I think, uh, at the Center for Internet and Society here about a year and a half to two years ago, published a report called Ranking Digital Rights that actually attempts to do exactly that, go through privacy policies, look at practices, and try to like rate companies uh, across a wide range of sort of providers uh, on their practices when it comes to digital rights broadly, of privacy of which was a key one. Sounds like you have a new business idea. I was just about to say. 
Um, there is a question in the front. Hello. Yeah, I'm a user of Android, and Android as a platform gives applications a framework for asking users, you know, the kind of permissions the applications uh, require. So why can't we use a similar idea uh, in Firefox for plugins? Suppose in Firefox, you know, you can have some sort of a validation and a framework for plugins to follow or suggest to users. These are the, you know, kind of data that I'm going to collect. So users who are installing those plugins will have some sort of a, you know, uh, you know, feeling of comfort that, okay, I'm okay to install this particular plugin. Absolutely. So it's just an idea. So we actually have, um, so uh, plugins, um, he's referring to extensions in Firefox. Uh, Firefox is, you could customize it in any way you want. You can go and download any number of extensions that are made by third parties. And so um, two things, we have a lot of policies and guidelines for developers and privacy and security are actually really core to a lot of that. And then we have um, uh, permissions. So, so the browser always drops down um, permissions in a certain format so that you know and you can trust this is your client Firefox talking to you and not someone impersonating it. So location is an example. If you go to a website and says, do you want to share your location with this website? That's the browser acting as your user agent asking you to make a choice. And so we have a series of permissions, just like on um, Apple or iOS, where there's permissions that people have kind of become accustomed to that we show when you install an extension. And it would sh um, walk you through the permission would drop so that you are aware what it has access to. Um, so we do that. So I think we have time for one more question, and then we'll check in online. Uh, I think there's one in the back. Right, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so. From a software developer point of view, uh, we work in major corporations, but the problem is we don't understand the legal ramifications or the legal side of things because it's total legalese. The terminology itself is like so thing that we just say the legal department to do something. For example, uh, just applying a patent itself, uh, we just work on only the innovation, the idea and the everything, the concept. Uh, we don't really look into the how the patent is applied or who is the authority and how the process is because we are not the domain experts. We just leave it to the legal department. They will say yes or no, binary answer that is comfortable with us and we take it. So how do we as developers kind of um, pitch lean data practices to major corporations legal team provided they are open to understanding and they are open to suggestion. I mean they will take it as a suggestion and they will evaluate and then only they will make their decisions. But how do I pitch it? to the legal department of my corporation. Do you want to take this? And then I'll add. Uh, so one of the things, I've gone to a couple of privacy engineering conferences this year, and one of the things that has been um, pretty striking to me is how a lot of companies are starting to really think about privacy engineering in their own context. Uh, and what has also sort of struck me is how many software developers really want to participate in something that makes them feel like they're meaningfully contributing to this kind of effort. And I think that especially in Silicon Valley, you're seeing a lot of software workers, frankly, walk away from their jobs. So they're not, they don't want to work there anymore, right? And I think that um, it's striking to me because it seems like you as the software engineer actually have a lot of power uh, because you are the person that has to build the products that the companies want to be able to ship and sell. Uh, and so you have uh, power in a way that I don't think uh, people have had in a while. Like you're seeing all of these things in, in the Silicon Valley and in Seattle where tech workers are starting to walk out. <laughs> they don't want to work on these types of products that are used in this way that they don't understand. Um, so I think that it might not be a single person making a single pitch to a single executive, but it might be that as like a class of people, as workers, um, you might just be able to work together and sort of say like, we're not going to do our jobs. <laughs> until you give us some way to participate meaningfully in something that makes us feel like we're making the world a better place. Yeah. I also think, you know, at the end of the day, a lawyer has to come ask an engineer, how does this work? Explain to me how this data works. And so it's another place where um, the developer or the engineer can really explain in detail and give the context because that other person is sort of the intermediary to write it down. Um, our practice is we always send it back 
uh, the, pers the, the developers or the engineer, whoever is closest to it must be able to read it and say, yes, this makes sense. Um, because then they are the ones who can come raise their hand and say, actually, we've made a change. It doesn't work like this anymore. Or no, you actually got it wrong. Um, and we have a lot of back and forth. So I do think um, the developers and the engineers who are writing this code have a lot of say. Yeah. So um, I think we've run out of time for any more questions in the room. Just want to check online. Any final thoughts from the, the stage? If I could just add to that one last point. Um, we, we're building a, a new browser called Firefox Lite in, in, my, in my group, and every single product feature, um, when we're planning that product feature, we try to understand what are the performance uh, signals that we're looking to see if that is a good feature or not. Um, and we, or, or what data would be needed to make that feature uh, uh, valid or to enable that feature. And everything has to be documented for um, the product management team, the engineering group, and also a data science team that is looking at collecting data. And, and they're all separate, they're, they're three separate groups, um, but they have to agree on and understand what it is we're trying to do. And if, any, and if any of those groups doesn't understand, they can raise a question, but it's all documented in, in what we're doing. And um, having that open discussion, I think, is the, the, the beginning of that, where uh, making sure that everyone on the team understands how that, wh what is the purpose of that feature? Uh, you know, and it's easy to ask, because you can always go back to what problem were we trying to solve? And <laughs> I know you, you may hear that a lot. I say that a lot too. But if we can all understand what is that, tech, uh, that business problem or technical problem we're trying to solve and start there uh, and build into the product and put the, the signals and the metrics into that and then understand and map that all the way out, um, it makes the job easier for everybody, right? Um, and so it, if, if you can establish that kind of working environment, that's the way to do it. Uh, and I know we've talked a lot about um, how the user experience of this kind of transparency gives you a competitive edge. But I also just want to uh, reiterate that um, as somebody who hires data scientists, as somebody who talks to a lot of people who want to get to data science, a lot of people that I talk to now, it's kind of shocking to me. Um, data science in a lot of ways has become sort of associated with a lot of, of not great things. And I have talked to a lot of people who really want to work in a place where they feel good about what they're doing. So you also have a competitive advantage in the labor market for data scientists because the really good ones don't want to be part of something that they feel is bad. Um, so if you can give this kind of story to the people who want to work in your companies, uh, you will have a bigger pool of the labor market to be able to hire from. Uh, and again, like it's very expensive and very costly to hire data scientists, so you want as much of an edge as possible. And I think a lot of people really want to work in a place where they're proud of the products that they produce. So thank you all for coming tonight after your day. It's Wednesday evening, maybe battle traffic. I don't know if it's raining outside. So we really appreciate your time. Um, thank you for everyone who joined online. Thank you, HasGeek, for hosting us. Um, this lecture is recorded. It's going to be available at airmozilla.org. If you want to see it later, the slides will also be posted there. And then um, we showed the website is leandatapractices.com. And on there is a public toolkit. There's several resources in Google Docs. If you want to just implement it in your own company, you can fork the documents and make them your own. So thank you. Good night. Thank you.